Desert Oasis. You find on the other hand Rolls Royces and swimming pools Streets like Bob Wolf Drive and Frank Sinatra's too Listen to its call in winter, spring and fall Palm Springs, Palm Springs Palm Springs, it's a great place, nice weather People come here to relax and get away from it. Sit around a pool, swim, play golf, play tennis. But there's a guy here who's not doing any of those things because he's come here to work. It's all business here for marvelous Marvin Hagler as he prepares for his middleweight title fight on April 15th against Thomas Hearns. Hagler's come a long way since he was a kid growing up in Newark, New Jersey. He's never forgotten what it was like to grow up in a poor, racially torn city. Hagler and Newark lived through troubled times during the 1960s, and he remembers the riots that bitterly divided Newark and forced his mother to move the family to Brockton, Massachusetts. I remember seeing all these tanks and all these military people uh, coming down the streets and people carrying rifles and things like that. It was in Brockton that Hagler met the Petronelli brothers who taught him how to box. A lot of tough kids come in off the street, but Hagler was different. The Petronellis knew he'd be something special. A trainer looks for certain things in a, in a fighter. Uh, one, number one, uh, uh, does he have the chin and does he have heart? Those two things uh, a trainer can't give a fighter. They generally have it, they don't have it. He, he had all these things. He had a cut lip or a bloody nose and come back the next day. Black guy. Bloody nose, my lip all swollen. I go home, my mother says to me, she says, Marvin, I never forget you. Are you sure this is what you want to do? I say, yeah, ma, I'm going to get this guy tomorrow. After about six months, he had these little photographs made of, of himself. He had some pictures taken. He used to sign them, he put them from the future middleweight champion of the world. Now, 17 years later, and Hagler is the middleweight champion of the world. His reputation inside the ring is fierce, but outside, well, that's a different story. Jamie? J-A-V-A-N. J-A-V-A-N. Oh, all right. How old are you, Jamie? Three. Three, huh? I got a little girl, three. I get along much better with the kids than I do with the adults. Uh, the kids are very honest. They're open. Uh, you see the big R in their eyes, you know? And uh, believe it or not, that breaks me down. I can be the meanest guy in the training thing, you know? But uh, some of the kids says, Mr. Hagler, can I get your autograph? I mean, that kind of breaks you down a little bit. The thing I like about Hagler is he hasn't forgotten the humble beginnings he came from. He still carries his own equipment bag to and from his workouts, just like he did back in his amateur days. Hagler doesn't have a big entourage of travel with him like most fighters do. His workout trunks look like he hand cut them with a pair of scissors. A reminder of the old days when Hagler was a young struggling boxer. Those are the days that I, I still remember, you know, and I still basically keep myself, uh, my feet planted on the ground. I don't, uh, <clears throat> I live within my means, you know what I mean? And uh, I understand uh, that, you know, you can't take things for granted. Hagler has long been the dominant fighter in the middleweight division, but it seems that he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. While heavyweights above him like Larry Holmes and welterweights below him like Sugar Ray Leonard had multi-million dollar paydays, all Hagler had was a title belt, but he wanted more. Good wow, we got this check! No, that's just my dad. <laughs> While guys like Leonard got the endorsements, Hagler stayed in shape, hoping that someday one of the welterweights would move up and challenge him for his title. All these guys like the Leonard's and, uh, and the Durans and the Benitas and the Hearns, they all start running their mouth. I said, fine, fine, okay. I said, if you guys want to fight, I says, I'm here. I ain't going nowhere. When you want me, come look for me. I'm right here. They said, I'll knock Hagler out. I want two and three titles. I want four titles. But they don't realize. They got to go through me to get it. Hagler had an almost invincible image until his 1983 fight with Roberto Duran. Hagler won a decision, but that aura of invincibility was gone. Duran was something special in a sense. Duran was fighting for his fourth world title. That meant that he would really go down in the history books. And uh, I think that in the first few rounds where they said that I gave Duran too much respect, maybe got caught up in, into that type of thing of showing him my skills, showing him how good I was. Hagler knows his reputation was tarnished against Duran, and he's determined not to let it happen again.
You see the purpose in Hagler's training, the non-stop activity. He knows it's the most important fight of his career. All these guys are sitting on the fence like vultures, you know, and they were all waiting for one thing. They're waiting for Marvin Hagler to be beat, and they're waiting for me, for somebody to knock me out, or either they're waiting for me to get gray hair. You know, see what I got on my hat. My hat says war. That's what my head's at. I'm working to get that mental toughness and I'm working to be physically strong because I've, I realize that this is what I have to do. The Hearns fight shapes up to be Hagler's toughest test yet, but Hagler's ready. Even as a kid growing up in Newark, he never doubted his own ability and he still doesn't. I feel as though that I have the ingredients to be Thomas Hearns. I'm gonna knock him out. I mean to knock him out. I've worked hard, I am the middleweight king and nobody's taking nothing away from me. And that I mean.